Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Josh Zalouf. He's the co-founder and CEO at Sudden Coffee. Josh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing is really innovative and cool. And I'm, I drink coffee all day, every day. So I'm very passionate about what you guys are doing selfishly myself. But maybe before we get into all that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in the Bay Area. I was actually born in New York, but okay. uh, my my uh, dad was into tech and did a couple startups. And so we moved to the Bay Area when I was um, six or seven. Okay. And so, so grew up in Palo Alto. Nice. That's a beautiful area of uh, kind of Northern California, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a great place to grow up. I was, I was, fortunate enough to be here, you know, during the nineties when the first tech boom was happening and it was a really interesting environment to be, to be a part of and just see how, you know, startups were evolving back then and, and what it was like. And I think, you know, definitely influenced my career, uh, obviously getting into, into, um, being an entrepreneur myself. Sure. So you went to university, what did you take and why? Yeah. So, um, I, I, um, so I went to Stanford. Okay. I did industrial engineering. Okay. And um, yeah, so the story was I I actually went to this McDonald's. This was after school. I was in Europe with a couple friends, okay. and they had a really long line. Okay. And I was obsessed with this question of like, how do you make a, a line shorter at a restaurant? Um, and I started looking at how you could move around the machines in the back and make it more efficient. And then when I got to college, I started asking myself, you know, I, there must be a job where you can get paid to do that and uh, to to make things more efficient. And um, I heard about this thing called consulting and, you know, you get paid to do that. And then I looked at different majors and industrial engineering had all of these classes on factories and supply chain. Um, and it was something my dad also had a startup earlier on that kind of touched on that. And so I'd heard those terms before. And so I, I took a couple classes and I was like, cool, this is it for me. This is what I want to do. That's very cool, man. No, that's, that's fascinating. So you get out of school, you've worked at a bunch of companies. Walk me through your journey up until Sudden Coffee. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I left school. I joined this company called McKinsey, which is a consulting firm. Okay. And, um, Again, it was all about, you know, how I could um, work on different efficiency problems. So I did all these consulting projects going to factories or call centers or, um, you know, places like that to figure out how to make them more efficient and um, did that for a few years. I was out in Boston on the East Coast. I wanted to just get out of California. Okay. Um, and I always knew I would sort of come back into the tech world. Uh, then after that, I, I wanted to make... Uh, basically to figure out how I could make an app to order food or drinks on your phone. Um, again, because I had a went to a bar with a really long line, and it was okay. again, you know, how do how do I combine efficiency and tech? Interesting. Um, yeah, so um, moved back to the Bay Area and worked with a couple friends trying to do a startup on, uh, with the three of us on um, making a way making an app to order drinks. Okay. And through that, realized. I didn't know anything about technology. I didn't know how to make a startup. I didn't know about apps. And um, I got a call from a friend at Groupon. Groupon at the time was the fastest growing company. And they said, hey, we want to make apps for restaurants. Okay. And I said, great, this sounds awesome. This is you know, exactly what I want to do. And so I joined Groupon and I was the um, product manager for this product called Breadcrumb, okay. which was basically square for high-end restaurants. Gotcha. And yeah. And so we were working on, uh, you know, exactly 
you know, those types of things. Like how could you make a restaurant more efficient with technology? How do you make orders easier? All that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the nail that, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the thing that it was, it totally shifted for me at some point working on that company or on that product, because I realized that, um, food and drink and coffee included, it's not about being as efficient as possible. It's actually about hospitality. It's about making someone feel good. It's about how you can um, change someone's day through that really awesome experience. Um, and so once that sort of clicked for me, and I also, I think a big part of this also was um, I started going to Burning Man around this time, had an experience there where I was serving drinks to people and realized that service really made me happy. Um, it was a way that I could connect with people. And, um, and so I, I left Groupon to do something related to food and service with the primary goal of making people feel good. And okay. that, that really was sort of how all the ingredients fit together. Interesting. So how did you come up with the idea and, and what exactly is Sudden Coffee? Yeah, so um, Sudden Coffee is the world's first single origin crystallized coffee. Okay, so, so um, does that we mean? take Yeah, so um, so single origin coffee, so this is what you'd think of as like hipster coffee or third wave coffee. Okay. Um, it's basically coffees that you kind of treat like wine, like you're buying coffees from specific farms. They each have really unique flavors. A coffee from Ethiopia is going to be different from a co- than a coffee from Colombia. Okay. Similarly to how, you know, like a wine from Napa Valley is different than a wine from Bordeaux or whatever it is, you know? Sure. Um, and so you normally, you know, you go to a cafe, you pay $5 for a pour over. It takes a long time to make it. And so what we did is we took really great coffees and we crystallized it. So, you know, it's, it's basically how instant coffee works. Okay. Um, you just mix it with, it comes in as a powder and you mix it with hot or cold water. You don't okay. need a machine. Okay. And you get this really awesome cup of coffee. Interesting. So how is it different from traditional instant coffee? Yeah, so so um, traditional instant coffee is made using uh, commodity level coffee beans. It's, okay. You know, they could be seven or eight years old. It's what, brewed really? up to. Yeah, it's like it's similar wow. to getting like rice or beans. Okay. Yeah, it's like dried coffee beans in these bags. It can be moldy. It can be damaged. Um, and then they'll brew it up to five times. Uh, to extract, they want to get as much out of the coffee bean as possible to make it dirt cheap. Okay. Um, but a coffee bean, it's mostly made out of wood. And so when you, you extract all that stuff out of the bean, it literally tastes woody. And that's kind of what instant coffee tastes like. Oh, um, well, you describe it better than I would. Most instant coffees, I think, taste like tar or something terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. And then, you know, the, and then they dry it out by basically boiling off the water. And when you do that, you know, you lose all the aroma because aroma right. boils off. So you just lose that. Okay. Um, that's kind of what you get. Um, what we did is we, we take really great coffee beans, obviously. It's, that's step one. We okay. invented a new way to brew coffee beans that okay. um, is really gentle like a cafe would. But we figured out how to do it at scale. And that okay. was really the hard part. Um and then we freeze dry it. And so freeze drying is a process that um, it locks the aroma into a crystal. And okay. that's why it's literally crystallized. And then you remove the water while it's still frozen. And so you, you lock in all of the really good stuff. Interesting. So walk me through a little bit of that trial and error process of actually figuring out how to do that. Because it's got to be time consuming and, and potentially really expensive. Or, or how did that or walk us through that process. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we went through, you know, I think uh, a really good example of this of the startup journey of starting with a, a minimum viable product or an MVP okay. as we will call it. Yeah. So um, we, uh, so I got introduced to my co-founder. He, uh, he'd been in coffee for 10 years and he had a prototype of the idea. So, the very first ones that we made, um, 
uh, we found a company that sells freeze dryers. You can buy them online. Okay. Um, they're consumer grade. It's a few thousand dollars. Okay. And so, um, uh, got one of those and then uh, looked at what we could freeze dry. So the very first thing we freeze dried was just regular drip coffee. You know, like the, like make a pot of coffee, freeze dry it, and see what we got. Okay. And um, it tasted really good, but we only got five cups of coffee out of this out of 36 hours of freeze drying oh, or wow. actually sorry not 36 hours 72 hours three days of freeze drying and we got wow. five cups of coffee okay so we we're like okay that's the problem <laughs> um, how do we increase the, the how do we make it more efficient well if the cost to it is more concentrated what can we do next then we, we'd get more cups of coffee and so um, we kind of would be of using espresso. espresso is really hard to make. It's really manual, but it's more concentrated. Okay. So we spent four hours making espresso, like hundreds of espresso shots, and freeze dried that. And then we got 60 cups of coffee out of that next 72 hours. Um, and after that, we were like, okay, that's somewhat viable, and started selling that. And we sold enough. Uh, and we bought more buyers and we literally hired people to pull espresso shots one at a time. And we did that for about six months. And then simultaneously, we were kind of scouring the one planet ways that we could brew instant coffee. You know, did someone have a machine? Did someone have a giant espresso machine? We're sort of like researching that. Um, and then uh, along the way, we, we've actually gone through a few different technologies, but the path is sort of you know, finding one technology that made things a little bit better, um, where, you know, at some point we were brewing 2,000 pounds of coffee at a time and it was coming out uh, more concentrated than espresso. And, but, you know, it wasn't tasting that great and we were kind of mixing the espresso with that coffee. And so there's just a lot of trial and error. Um, we probably change our recipe, I would say, every three months. There's something different that we're doing to the process. Um, but that was a... Yeah, I, I think the important thing along the way was, you know, we, we were validating that people wanted this uh, at small checkpoints Okay. Um, but as we were going along the way. So, you know, even though we could only make a thousand cups a month using that espresso process, like off of that, we were able to raise money, we were able to get PR, and that helped us get to the next level where we could then you know, make bigger investments or do bigger things. Got you. So you, you touched on something that I was going to ask later, but I, I think we should cover it now. So it sounds like you self-funded at the beginning and then you raised some capital or walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, uh, it, we actually were, were fortunate enough to be able to raise capital from the beginning. Okay. Um, and and it, it's actually re like really, it, it makes a lot of sense in retrospect. And I think I would totally do it again this way. So uh, my my co-founder, and he actually raised money from like right before we had met. Uh, he came up with the idea of, you know, could we make this really good instant coffee by running into a guy at a conference and that they sort of were just talking about it. And he had a science lab because he was, um, he was still in school part-time at the time and made a very basic prototype um, in a science lab okay. and then took that and then made a five slide deck and went to um, investors and said, Hey, you know, I have this vision for, you know, re like this product and here, here's some, it was literally in a zip Ziploc bag, but try it. It tastes really good. And I haven't sold any yet. And I, but you know, instant coffee is this huge, market 30 it's a 30 billion dollar market and wow really it, it yeah it's a huge i mean internationally instant coffee is huge and it hasn't seen any innovation in 20 years wow um and it was one of those things that was you know an obvious you know of course that this this kind of makes sense um the way that it was framed and so from that he was able to raise um, 500k just as at, from from different investors, and um, you know, fortunately, had found, he um, had linked up. He was based in Finland, linked up with a guy in Finland who 
uh, was a serial entrepreneur and sort of helped made the round make the round happen. Um, but that was that was sort of how we were able to fund the initial stages. Interesting. No, I that that makes no. That's that's really interesting. So walk me through. How did you know when you had a product that you could actually start either giving it out to people to try or, or start going to stores to get them to actually put it in their in their shops or and uh, start selling it online? Yeah, so um, we tried to, to to get to something like that as, as fast as possible. Sure. So I think when when um, when uh, Kali and I got, had met. Uh, he had made a few of these cups, and, okay. but hadn't really started selling it yet. And okay. the company had been around, you know, he'd started it about two months earlier. And in our very first meeting, you know, the question that I was asking was, how do we sell this tomorrow? How do we sell it next week? Right. And uh, what's the fastest way we can make a prototype? It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to, uh, you know, uh, be polished. We don't need a label. We don't need any of that. Let's just sell it. And it was um, actually around this time three years ago. Okay. And I said, you know, Christmas is coming up. Why don't we make a stocking stuffer? And ah, good idea. Just see if we can sell. Yeah, can we sell a hundred of these things? Okay. And so uh, we got to work. He was pulling the espresso shots. I okay. was packaging it and making the boxes. And we threw up a website. We used Shopify. Sure. And uh, we just said, you know, hey, we have. A uh, hundred of these things. We were selling it for five dollars for two, which at the time we thought was unheard of. You know, no one's going to pay two fifty a serving for instant coffee. Okay. And um, and we put it up, blasted it on Facebook and Instagram, and we sold out in in under five minutes. Wow. And so that told us, great. You know, there's something here. But like, compared sure. to the other ideas I'd worked on, that was you know crazy. So. That was sort of the the validation we did to say, okay, great, there's something here. Sure. Well, to be fair, and you could tell me if I'm correct or not. Like, okay, forget about the traditional instant coffee because I think it's terrible, and I think most people that actually really enjoy coffee would agree with me. And the only other competitor I could potentially think of is the Starbucks instant coffee, but it's not very good. Like, it's drinkable at least. That's probably best case but but is that fair to say or 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 what's your thoughts on that like are there are like competitors are other... for them for you guys sorry yeah so uh when we started in the market starbucks was the next closest that okay. was the best in coffee that was sure. out there um there are now a couple other companies that have uh, so you know, sort of cloned our approach. Okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, most of the industry, you know, hasn't really moved us yet. Okay, interesting. So, walk me through the the packaging of the product because it, it doesn't look like a tr traditional coffee product. Never mind instant coffee product. Yep. Totally. Yeah, so so we use single serve test tubes for okay. the product. Okay, and what made you we, pick that out of curiosity? So yeah, so so we we started with single serves because uh, as soon as you open our product, yeah. it starts to it, it starts to lose freshness. Uh -huh. um, with any great coffee, it's it's generally pretty fragile, um, and so the great thing about instant coffee is if it's kept packaged it'll last for, it, it could last for years. And, okay. and so that's really great. But if you were to, for example, take a jar of our product and open it, and let's say, you know, your your kid accidentally opens the jar and leaves it unopened, uh, it could literally turn into a rock over the course of a couple of days. And so, uh, because it's, it's absorbing water from the air as fast as possible. So we wanted to keep it at single serves at first because, and we wanted to make it really, really easy, really, really simple and and error proof so that anybody could have this really great copy without doing any work. It was just, you know, one tube, one cup. That's it. You know, there you go. Sure. And the test tubes actually started out kind of by accident. I think 
you know, one of our advisors recommended it to us as, you know, hey, well, it, this would be really cool and scientific and it would look like a lab experiment. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. Um, and, and more importantly, you know, we could buy them online. We could buy them on Amazon. We didn't need, uh, uh, we, we didn't need a packaging line. We could like hand fill it, which is what we were doing. Um, and then as we launched with it, we it, we noticed it was really Instagrammable, and for you know an e-commerce brand, sure, people started sharing it uh, and 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 showing it online. Um, now I think a few years later, um, we've also realized that um, for single serve, it's the most eco-friendly option that we can provide. Sure. So like K cups are not recyclable. No. Um, and then e even those foils, like a Starbucks via packet is yeah. not recyclable, but our product is recyclable. And so that was really, really important to us. Yeah, the whole packaging is then like from the box to the bag, to the, to obviously like the lid and then the test tube itself. Yeah. Interesting. No, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, exactly. It's all, it's basically hundred percent eco-friendly and that was, you know, really critical. Well, and the other thing too, is you could easily put a well one or a few of them in your pocket or in your purse or something right yeah exactly and you know when we find a lot of our customers they keep them everywhere you know someone will have some in their desk they have sure. them in their backpack have them in their pocket uh in the suitcase and so you know wherever you go you kind of have that and it's like an emergency stash um <laughs> for like a really good coffee sure but you guys also have a, a pouch as well correct Exactly. Okay. And, and so we, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So we, we found that I was talking to a couple customers and, you know, someone said, I wish I could have this every day, but it's, uh, it's just a little too expensive. And um, I asked her, you know, where are you using it? And she said, I'm using it in my kitchen. I'm not really traveling with it. And great. Well, what if I, you know, what if we gave it to you in a pouch and, um, you know, we could make it a lot cheaper that way. Um, downside is it wouldn't last that long it wouldn't last as long as soon as you open it and she said no well i'm going through it so that's not a problem sure and i said great okay let's try it and so we we created that product interesting no that that makes a lot of sense i i love how you took customer feedback and created a new line right i think that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah and that's that's made most of the decisions at sudden. Um, I try to talk to customers, at least a couple folks a week. Uh, if you subscribe to sudden, you'll get an email from me to, to schedule a time to chat. Okay. And that's usually how we make most of our decisions. Yeah, no, I think that's great. So you guys have a couple different uh, roasts. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. So we have a light roast and a medium roast. Okay. Are you guys going to do any others or you just want to stick with that for now or, or walk us through that? Uh, yeah. So we're, we're actually now changing the business in a pretty big way. And okay. it's really, really exciting for us. We're, we're starting to work with ro roasters uh, more closely and create branded products for other roasters. So, um, you know, in the Bay Area, so we already work with five, okay. uh, Equator Coffee, Intelligentsia Coffee, Ritual Coffee, um, Chromatic Coffee, and Ozo Coffee. Okay. And uh, basically, if, if you own a you know, chain of cafes and you make your own coffee beans, um, you can send us as little as 250 pounds. We will convert it into your own line of instant coffee. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. Um, and you know, we found that it's a great way to educate customers on how, what instant coffee can be. And, you know, the community has been really supportive. And so now um, we only have two on our website right now, but okay. in reality, we have um, five different roasts or five different beans that we use. And we're just figuring out exactly what the right strategy is for our website for how we're going to launch those. But the plan, you know, imagine you come to our website six months from now and, you know, you could find dozens of different coffees from all these different roasters. Sure. Well, it's interesting, right? Because I've been to San Francisco a few times and, you know, the one of the greatest things about being in San Francisco is the coffee, right? And so if if I can get some of those coffees 
shipped to me somewhere else in the world that I can only enjoy if I'm physically in San Francisco, that's great, right? Or if I really like this and I'm traveling, you can just basically take it with you where you can't really do that in a lot of cases now, right? Yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head 100%. And our goal is that you can have your favorite copy anywhere in the world. And especially, you know, like a lot of people don't have access. Like a lot of people can't go to San Francisco. Sure. But, but you know, right now they can't. It's, there's no, not an easy way for them to get to try those copies. Or if they do, you know, they have to have all this brewing equipment and know, and know how to brew it properly if they order the beans. And, you know, I'd love it if, you know, someone in, you know, Asia or Europe can experience copy from here really easily. Like that's, that's sort of, that, that excites me. That makes, that, that, that's fantastic. And that's really what, what we've been able to do recently, which is great. Sure. So do you guys just ship in North America or just the States or worldwide or, or walk us through that? Um, yeah. So today we ship only North or we ship in the U S and Canada okay. on our website. Okay. Um, we early on experimented in the first six months, you could buy it anywhere in the world. Okay. Um, and we are actively trying to find distributors internationally who can make it available internationally for us. Okay. So um, there's a few places, you know, we have someone in Pakistan and we're about to go live oh, with someone in Dubai. Cool. Um, who are going to be spreading the brand out to different countries. Got you. No, that's very cool. And you guys have a subscription uh, service as well. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. So so uh, you can buy Sudden on our website either as a subscription or as uh, single purchases. Okay. When we started, we were subscription only. And okay. you know, that was our original business model. And we found that you know, we were limiting people from trying the product or, you know, people who just wanted it for a camping trip couldn't sure. really get it. And so uh, we decided uh, about nine months ago to remove the subscription only option. And now we're much more focused on just having you try it and experience it. And it doesn't matter if you subscribe or it doesn't matter if you have it, you know, 10 times or one time, we just want you to be able to um, share this. And sure. that's, that's kind of our, our mission. Sure. So how long does the coffee keep in the little test tube then? It'll keep for for nine months at least. Okay. Interesting. That's a long time, actually. Yeah, exactly. So um, roasted coffee beans, if you're buying beans from a cafe to make it home, it'll yeah. last two weeks. Okay. And so having that same taste nine months later is pretty significant. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So I'm curious to know a little bit more about where do you guys kind of see this thing going? Because you mentioned you're going to basically start working with all these um, coffee shops. But in a lot of cases, I think you could even work with the big brands as well, right? Yeah, so I think that's that's where this is headed. You know, we've we've developed a technology now and we we didn't intend on doing this when we started i think we thought we were going to find people who could manufacture for us okay but what ended up happening is you know, we now have a way where we can make instant coffee that tastes phenomenal at a price point that's cheap enough to sell retail uh, and yeah. in batch sizes that are small enough that can support single origin coffees because um the, the downside about single origin is you know there's only a shipping containers worth of a specific copy compared to you know if you're starbucks you need to have you know millions of pounds of that copy to be able to sell it across all your stores sure um, and so so to be able to do that at small scale is really unique and so um the way that i see this going now is um imagine you know, there, there are hundreds of different roasters out there, and I think it's going to make sense for everyone to have an instant coffee version of their product. Okay. And so imagine, you know, you go to Whole Foods and you see a, a new instant coffee aisle, and, you know, there are dozens of brands of your favorite coffees out there. And this is already happening. One, um, Ritual Coffee, one of, our, um, one of our partners, is 
um, sudden in the Whole Foods in uh, January or February. And so we're starting to see this evolution where I, I really think this is going to be a category. And I hope it's a way that, uh, you know, becomes a really primary way that people drink coffee. You know, instead of having to go buy a pot or, you know, brew an entire pot, if you just want one cup at home, this is going to be the way to do it. And that's really where I see it going. Yeah. No, it, that makes a lot of sense. The, it's interesting because I almost see it like an alternative to like the K-cups like that you mentioned earlier, right? I think some of the biggest appeal of it is I can buy dozens of different flavors and then cherry pick what I want to drink right now and then maybe later in the day or whatever, right? But with what you guys are doing is I could get your brand, like I could maybe buy uh, one or two of them at the store and then uh, two more of another brand. Like I could potentially buy individual ones from a bunch of different brands and then just pick the ones I want to drink then and there instead of buying even like full bags, right? And then it, it almost el eliminates that K-cup kind of thing. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Because you could basically like, well, how big are the test tubes? Because it's hard to, to to judge size on, on screen, but are they the size of maybe like chapstick or a little bit bigger or, or what's the size on them? Yeah, they're they're slightly bigger than chapstick. Okay. Um, it's probably, uh, and they're four inches tall. Okay. Yeah, so you could easily yeah. put like a ton of them in a, a shelf or something in in a grocery store or almost when you're at the checkout, right, where they have the chocolate bars and gum and stuff, right? Totally, totally. Yeah, and it's already in there in some in some stores. There's a, we have a stand where they stand up. Um, and uh, you can you can buy singles and and just have one cup of coffee. Interesting. No, that's cool, man. So I, I'm curious though to to know a little bit more about your process because are you guys kind of constantly trying new things, or you figured it out and you're just gonna keep going with it, or or what's your kind of innovation process? Yeah. So we're we're trying new things all the time. Okay. Um, I think our primary objective is around reducing cost. Ah, so sure. We, yeah, exactly. So we started with something that was really high quality um, and it, it used to cost us $6 to make each cup of coffee. Okay. And, and, and we were selling it for $6. So we were making any money. Gotcha. And, um, and so the, the, our innovation or what we focus on is how do I make it cheaper while maintaining or improving quality okay, is really what we have to figure out. Sure. And so because of different process changes, you know, we've able, we've been able to reduce cost by half every, wow. uh, every year. And so now, um, you know, we're just at the point where it costs us about a dollar um, to make each cup of coffee and we're aiming for it to cost us 50 cents okay. by April. Gotcha. And so we want to be able to offer this for $1.50 a serving. Currently, as of only a couple weeks ago, you can now buy sudden $2 per serving. Okay. It was $3 per serving in September. Gotcha. And so we, we keep lowering the price. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, but the way that we, we, we brew it now, we, we basically take coffee beans and we grind it. We work with, currently we're working with, um, a supplier that has machine and process that can brew the beans that we sort of, you know, gotcha. vetted and work really closely with. And then we uh, uh, concentrate it and then we freeze dry it. Okay. And that sort of is how we were able to, to make it, you know, really, really efficient. And the way that we do each of those steps is, is really unique. Um, I, I, a, a lot of it is trade secrets that we sure. specifically developed that that make it work um, so, and then in april for example we've actually invented a totally new brewing process that interesting imp both improves the quality and decreases the cost um, and so we're moving to that which is another big change we're making very cool so are you guys still doing a, other than the part you mentioned um that you have a company to brew the beans 
Are you guys still doing a lot of the rest of it, like packing, packaging it yourself, or have you got like a co-packer or something? Everything else is in house. Okay. Um, we, yeah, a hundred percent. We currently fill each tube. It's it's semi-automatic, so there's a person who is, um, you know, hits a machine pedal on a machine, and powder goes in one tube at a time. Uh, in January, okay. we're we're moving to a fully automated line, which is actually going to also improve quality, and and um, yeah, so we're we're sort of building out all this these core competencies internally. Very cool. I I love how you're constantly improving and trying to automate and and make things ch- as cheap as possible, right? And then transferring that savings onto the consumer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the cool thing, and I think people assume the opposite of this, is things that make it cheaper also improve quality. So a lot of folks will see a price reduction and assume that, oh, that means it got worse. You're using worse ingredients. But, um, you know, the packaging line we're buying, for example, uh, it, it will nitrogen flush the tubes before coffee goes in. So it makes it oxygen free, which increases oh, the shelf life. Got you. So. And it's automated, which means it happens faster. And so that is going to decrease the cost and improve the quality. And it makes sure the caps go, the caps will seal on, you know, more readily. And so like that has happened in a bunch of different ways throughout the process. Gotcha. And that's really cool. And I think something that, that isn't obvious from the outside. Sure. But if people are already paying $3 per serving, why would you make it two? Like what was the rationale behind doing that? So we, again, from talking to a bunch of customers, okay. um, we believe there's there's sort of this cliff when you go under $2 okay. that um, will, makes it okay to drink more regularly. Ah. So um, I, if the, you know, how people have framed it is, um, you know, there's, it, at the end of the day, this is a take-home product okay. thing that, you you can't grab it grab and go and drink it in the same way that you could with like a granola bar and okay. so um because it still requires a little bit of work like you still have to pour the water and pour it um folks have told us you know like it feels like it needs to be under two dollars a dollar fifty okay um before it can really replace my everyday habit because you. above that you know, if I'm paying, you know, someone said, you know, I'm paying, it's the same price as a cup of Starbucks co- coffee. And I said, you know, is, well, would you rather have this over Starbucks? And he's like, you know, I would rather like sudden it is way, way better than Starbucks. But okay. for some reason, mentally, I just feel like it needs to be under $2 because I have to just do a little bit of work. Um, Interesting. And that sort of made sense to us. And, and when we started the company, you know, we, this was three years ago now, we said, well, what's the next best in St. Coffee? Starbucks via. That's about 75 cents a serving. So, you know, like it kind of makes sense for this to be $1.50. Like some in the air, like that's roughly what we want to aim for. Okay. And so that's still feels right for where it needs to go. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And it, it's cool that you guys are that um, in tune with your customers and you take their feedback and actually implement it, right? But I'm also assuming that you probably get some wild requests that you're you're like, well, we're just not going to do that. Or do you try to do most of the things that customers recommend to you guys? Yeah, we definitely get a, a lot of requests, and it's it's hard to figure out which ones to listen to and which sure. ones not to. Um, a big one is, you know, folks asking for flavor, like hazelnut coffee or vanilla uh, coffee or okay. exactly, yeah, asking for, for cream and sugar in their coffee, like built in. Um, oh, interesting. we actually got, um, there's a, 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 I actually got some advice recently about how to, uh, you know, filter out the noise that I think is just really makes sense for anyone working on a startup. Okay. Um, with, Listen to the, so we, we sent out a poll that said, you know, if sudden coffee didn't exist. How disappointed would you be? Okay. And there were people who said very disappointed, somewhat disappointed or not disappointed. Okay. And the advice was basically listen to the 
listen to the feedback from the people who are either very disappointed or somewhat disappointed. Okay. Because they're very close to being very, very happy with the product. But don't listen to the people who say they would not be disappointed. Like they're super far off and they're not going to be, you know, interested in the product. And so the people who said, you know, I'm not disappointed were the same people. You know, the people who said I wouldn't be disappointed if something didn't exist anymore were the people who both fixated on things like, you know, I want to have like I need to have more options, more roasts, more, um, uh, you know, flavors and all this stuff. And the people who said, you know, I really like it, but I would but there's just a little bit that's off for me focused on either the price or wanting it to not be a subscription. Yeah, no, that's that's actually really good advice. You're right because you can end up chasing your tail with the customers that are that are just not that wouldn't be disappointed because they'll suggest crazy things and you might try to implement them and then it'll be another thing and then another thing and they'll never be happy. So I think that's really good advice. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's and it's, you know, it, as I luckily came from a product management background and okay. that's what you see, you know, you're trying to convince someone to buy something and they put up a door like, you know, I'm not going to buy it because you don't have this. Yeah. And the question is, is there another door right behind it yeah. or is that the door that's going to lead them to buy it? And filtering that out is really difficult. No, that's fair. So is there any other advice you'd give to people that are doing a startup or, or getting into the food and beverage space? Yeah. Uh, um, and so I, I think one thing that I, that I've realized recently is, uh, just how much there are these random events that sort of, um, like end up be that you couldn't really predict and end up massively changing the direction of your company. Okay. Um, one example, um, and, and I call these, I've been calling these black swan events. Okay. Um, I, and the idea is, like one example of this is um, the second time we raised funding, we so we we made a prototype of the product, we sent it to a coffee reviewer in the New York Times. Okay. He made this post about, or he made he wrote an article about sudden coffee, and an investor and the, the um, girlfriend at the time, uh, now his wife of one of, uh, of an investor, happened to read the article, passed it to this guy, he read it. He happened to be looking for a caffeine-based subscription business, and then happened to, uh, and then you know, was in San Francisco, called us up, and um, we got a term sheet for an investment within a couple within a week. Wow! And you know, the, the next time I tried fundraising, it was a much longer process, like nine months, sort of slogging away at, at making it happen. Sure. And that was really unpredictable, and so. I realized that um, a lot of times, you know, we we tend to really focus on like what is the to do list of things that I need to do to um, like hit my next goal, and I'm going to make this really long list, sure. and I'm going to just start focusing on them. And then the things that allow you to sort of broadcast what you're working on, or um, uh, get connected with random people, things like going to a conference, or things like um, you know, writing a blog post, just tell your story where like, if you're, if you're doing the math, you're not going to be able to put a dollar value on that blog post. Right. Um, whereas you might be able to put a dollar value on improving that Facebook ad, sure. but that, those, that blog post or that PR event or that company party you through, um, you know, that might get the right person excited about something who might come join your team who might change the direction of the company. And, and so I, I realized more recently that it's really critical to invest time in uh, these things that could generate these random occurrences, even if you can't, you know, put, make a business model for why you should do that thing. Yeah, I, I think that's really good advice, right? And it's, it's just putting yourself out there, really, and, and making connections and creating content it's interesting what that can do, right? And you're right. You can't really put a dollar value on that. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, a lot of folks who, um, especially in the Bay Area, a lot of folks who become entrepreneurs uh, are coming at it for, you know, from the tech side where they were an engineer. And, and, you know, I came from this also. And so, like, when you're approaching something with an engineering standpoint, you're always focused on how many, like, is this the most optimal action that I should be taking right now? Yeah, and so those things that you can't put a dollar value on, you're just not going to do. Sure. And, and so that's where you get caught in that trap. And that's, I think my biggest realization recently has been to not listen to that and to the opposite. No, I, I think that's really good advice, but we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and any other links you want to mention. Yeah. So, uh, so if you're interested in, in checking out sudden, you can buy sudden on Amazon Okay. Um, just search for Sudden Coffee. You can also buy it on our website, SuddenCoffee.com. And uh, for for listeners of the show, uh, we created a discount code called Future Show. And so if you just type that in on our website during checkout, um, just wanted to give people a little treat uh, for for listening, and you know, really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate that, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you. And have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, likewise. Thanks very much. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.